Okay, so the topic today is support vector machines. And as far as I could tell from what you have done in statistics, nah, in, in machine learning for data science previously, you have dealt with classification methods. On some of your slides, there were also support vector machines, but as far as I understood, you didn't really do the slides, if that's somewhat correct. Um, and um, so today I'm going to talk about support vector machines. You find the material on the uh, web page where I have um, the statistics for data science. So there are now three parts or so. So the first thing is uh, probability, frequent statistics, Bayesian statistics, and then there's one uh, entry under machine learning now, which is support vector machines. So that's where you find the material. Um, so support vector machines, from my perspective, are actually one of the few topics that one can consider as being different from uh, statistics and data analysis in some way, at least, um, and hence uh, be called more machine learning than statistics. Um, from my perspective, there's actually only really support vector machines and um, neural networks. However, if one goes a little bit deeper into um, support vector machines and actually how they arose, um, then they actually are also part of statistics because they arose in the context of statistical learning theory, which is kind of a frequent statistics approach. However, um, today I will present them from the machine learning perspective, so no probabilities today. Um, that's the plan. Um, so um, first I give you some uh, introduction and some stuff and um, then um, we are going to um, cover first the geometric aspects of linear discriminant functions which are sometimes glossed over in these um, descriptions um, of, of support vector machines but which I found it's, uh, partly not necessarily be very intuitive so I think it makes sense to talk about that a little bit. And then I'm going to tell you about support vector uh, machine training. And then the um, one main point of, of today's um, session or tutorial or lecture, or whatever, whatever, is to show you um, how support vector machine training is related to constraint optimization. And in some way, uh, yeah, um, that's, that, that's of course very important. And there's a little bit of a difference compared to what we do in statistics, because in statistics, you have, of course, if you do a parameter estimation, you also have optimization problems, and you would also um, use constraint optimization stuff. But here, the um, objective function doesn't arise from a probabilistic model. So that's the main difference to uh, what we usually do in statistics. Um, and then the aim is, um, uh, we'll say that again later, to um, show you how to formulate SVM training as a quadratic program. Um, and then um, have you actually um, do that. Um, so, oops, there's something missing. I think that's the Alpadain um, um, book. Um, Alpadine, or whatever his name is. Um, so, support vector classification and support vector machines are, um, you find them in every machine learning book. And as you noticed from the previous lectures in these, this course, you also find them in data mining books, because I think what you mainly done so far is data mining. Um, who has studied support vector machines previously? So not applied, not used a toolbox, but has studied, um, for example, the dual uh, dual Lagrangian formulation. So that's what I'm. No, who has to transform transform it into a KKT problem? Yeah, essentially. Um, who has applied them using a toolbox? Some of you. Okay. Um, so they are really like an important topic in, in, in machine learning. Um, the, um, so you find them in all the books. The literature goes back to the 60s um, in the works of uh, Vapnik and then um, particularly the 90s in this work by Bosa and Cortes and Vapnik. Um, a very um, yeah, um, comprehensive coverage of support vector machines you find in this work by um, 
Schulkopf and Smola, who were students of uh, Vatnik, and um, published this uh, book on kernel methods um, in the early 2000s. Um, so this whole thing is about, and assume that you kind of know the relevance of uh, these kind of things um, by now, um, so that I don't have to tell you that there is something called data and that sometimes you want to classify data and why this uh, might be uh, something that data scientists do. So I assume you know all of this. Um, what um, what we will basically uh, discuss then is um, um, the question or let's say the, the mechanics of the answer to the question of what is a good classification boundary. So um, here's an example. So you um, have um, two-dimensional features, um, so dots in uh, 2D space, x1 and x2, and um, they come with their class label. So you see the red dots and you see the blue dots. And um, that's the data that you have, training data. And um, you are now asked, or the question is now, what is a good um, um, classification uh, boundary? So um, if you observe a new data point and it falls to the left or to the right of um, one of these boundaries, so these should be three examples. So one being like this, one being like this, and the other one being like this. Um, what is, uh, what is um, a good uh, classification boundary? And the answer that is inherent in support vector machines and in statistical learning th uh, theory is um, that you um, that a classification boundary that um, has a, a wide margin or a large margin is a good thing. The reason why this is a good thing, um, this goes really into statistical learning theory and empirical risk minimization, and we will actually not discuss that because today it's machine learning and not statistics. And of course, also because I, um, at this point, know more about the mechanics of constructing these large margin classifiers than um, about statistical learning theory and per se. So that's a little bit the limit uh, here. So um, the fundamental answer is that a classification boundary with a large margin is a good thing. Um, you can, of course, ask and you should ask why if you are a scientist and not a uh, um, just a data analyst, um, why this is a good thing. And then, like I said, the answer is um, in statistical learning theory, so study that. But today we will focus on um, actually getting um, such a, a large margin um, um, classification um, um, boundary from training data. Um, all of this is um, yeah, based on work by Vladimir Vapnik. Um, so he started this whole thing in the uh, 60s, basically with, um, so the, the story there is a little bit that uh, after, um, after the war, uh, neural networks or the perceptron, which I guess you have encountered, uh, were um, proposed and st statistics was kind of uh, going into a more mathematical, uh, mathematical uh, way and what what it turned out to be a little bit of a problem uh, was the um, curse of um, uh, dimensionality. So who knows what the curse of dimensionality is or what people usually mean by that? So the data gets very sparse in high dimensions. Yeah. So that um, if yeah if you have multi-dimensional data points. Um, then they um, fill, if you have the same number of samples um, for high dimensional or low dimensional data points, they fill less of the um, space and it gets harder to estimate things. And then the problem of um, estimating and predicting um, um, new data points um, based on this um, gets worse. So this was kind of um, the finding a little bit at this time was that things like Fisher's linear discriminant, so a way to do a binary classification based on a um, probabilistic model. Um, so by basically using two Gaussians and estimating the parameters based on data, that um, that uh, required quite a lot of um, parameters uh, to be estimated, and um, then not necessarily give good gen uh, gener uh, generalization or prediction performance. So they um, and and this was found for um, neural networks and. and um, 
um, the perceptron at that time. So the question was, how does that uh, work? And so they developed this um, statistical learning theory, which tries to um, yeah, find um, a means to understand why certain um, prediction algorithms or prediction methods work well and others don't. So, <coughs> so that's what, what they started. But then um, the real, um, yeah, so the, the, the class, so he always did two things. He developed this statistical learning theory, which is more uh, um, um, a probabilistic theory on uh, what gives good generalization uh, performance, what are the uh, parts um, that are a good idea um, to optimize. This whole with a little bit of a different um, viewpoint than in statistics, where in statistics you always try to uh, get to the real but unknown uh, function, so the real but unknown uh, probability distribution, while um, their focus was a little bit more on and, and emphasized a little bit more. It's not that important that you uh, approximate the true but unknown thing that well, but that you approximate the prediction um, um, well, which can mean that you get good prediction uh, for um, data which was uh, generated on uh, some other statistical model um, than your actually prediction uh, um, machine is. So that was his, uh, this is the approach there. And um, this is, I think it's, it's a reasonable thing to um, care about uh, prediction um, and good uh, predictive performance more than about uh, discovering the truth um, in terms of um, recovering what the true generative model is um, from a, an applied perspective. So from an applied perspective, this is definitely important for, for doing science. I think um, you, of course, want to work more on the generative uh, uh, world where you want to develop generative models. So, um, so I think machine learning uh, um, methods with this philosophy they are good for for applications, um, but I don't think they are very good for science. That's my personal view. Um, yeah. Um, so this is kind of the background. So Vatnik's statistical learning theory is a mathematical framework for finding good predictive functions based on data. And as I just said, the predictive performance is valued higher than the uh, correctness of the approximations. And support vector machines were developed in this context of statistical learning theory. Um, so that's kind of the history. Uh, I think I've already mentioned that. So you find this paper, these papers, of course, also. Um, so definitely the Bosa and the Cortez and some uh, readings by Vapnik in the reading material. Um, that um, uh, so that really came to rise then after the um, um, yeah in the early to mid nineties uh, and then in the late nineteen nineties um, so the students and, and, and people so around Vapnik um, started to push uh, SVMs into the uh, mainstream in machine learning by setting up for example these SVM toolboxes. Uh, who, does anyone, which toolbox have you used for SVM? So there are, there's for example, libsvm, that's a total toolbox um, that was uh, developed there. They set up a website and did uh, summer school, so they really pushed SVMs into the mainstream. So um, in the 2000s then, so from the late 90s to around uh, 2010, 10, SVMs were really considered the best classification uh, method there is. And um, interest in neural networks at that time was quite low. Um, yeah, like I always said, when I entered this kind of uh, data science world or whatever neural imaging in 2005, in, in uh, 2004, 2005 in tubing, they laughed at me when I uh, played a little bit with neural networks and everybody was about SVMs. And, and that then shifted um, quite dramatically, I think, um, around uh, 2010, um, where you now have this uh, neural network um, hive. So SVMs, um, I can't really say about uh, much about the state of SVMs uh, these days, so I looked a little bit at the conferences. Um, so it, um, the uh, machine learning conference, what's the name, GCML, I don't know. Um, I hardly found any SVM stuff um, like from the abstracts this year. And also, um, nay, there I found a little bit um, in terms of um, the questions of um, 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 guarantees and performance guarantees. Uh, at NIPS, I didn't find anything about SVMs. 
The thing is, SVMs in principle come with uh, much more theory and much more guarantees on their performance than neural networks. Um, but um, yeah, it's a bit of a hype um, community. So right now, neural networks are the thing. So who knows what uh, is happening um, in the future? And then you always have these things that then the old things get adapted under the new paradigms. For example, variational inference now lives under the name of variational autoencoders in uh, the net the new network world and maybe something similar will happen to SVMs. I don't know. Um, anyway, they are around. I don't know. Uh, I don't have any numbers on, on their use, but um, they are kind of the thing that was what neural networks, so when, when neural networks are these days, this is what they were, what SVMs were in the 2000s. Thing is, SVMs are a little bit harder to understand than neural networks, so this also might have to do with that. And of course, you always get this hype when people don't quite understand how it's working, and once they know how it's working, they are like, well, maybe we can do something better, and after all, it's not that magic. Um, so what we are going to do now, and what we're going to discuss, is first the geometric foundations of maximum and soft margin classifications, so that you kind of um, understand um, what the underlying model is of a um, support vector machine and how this um, relates to these pictures that you always see, which I already shown you with these um, two-dimensional um, data where you have these um, hyperplanes in. And then the main thing that I want to show you is um, how to translate SVM training, so parameter estimation in uh, SVMs, how to translate that into a constrained quadratic programming problem in a sense to enable you to um, go with your toolbox applications one layer deeper. So instead of um, using um, the toolbox uh, for the machine learning method, you use the toolbox here for the um, constraint optimization um, um, problem, So, which is more general than um, SVMs because constraint optimization you know uh, you need um, everywhere. And finally, you might have heard there's something called kernel methods, um, and the kernel methods are motivated by a particular way that the um, SVM um, objective training function comes out. So I want to show you the, uh, the motivation there, because I always find it quite hard to understand why they, where this kernel kind of thing is coming from. And um, what we, however, will not uh, cover is um, statistical learning theory per se. So there's also this thing called VP, nee, VC uh, dimensions, things like that we will not uh, um, cover. Also, we don't, as I already said, we will not ask why maximum margin or large margin is a good idea. We will just assume that this is a good idea and how we can do it. Um, there's a typo. Um, we will not discuss multi-class classifications, so more than two classes we will not do. And we will also not give really an introduction to kernel methods. So there's a lot more you can learn about support vector machines. Um, so look into the box. Um, so that's the aim for today here. Um, I want to um, show you how to uh, train and test an SVM using not an SVM toolbox, but uh, a, pa um, um, a quadratic programming routine or toolbox. So instead of using an SVM toolbox, you are going to use um, um, uh, optimization toolbox, which is something. Um, this will be the exercise, um, but we will get to back to that. Um, it will use this convex optimization from uh, convex opt org. Um, yeah, and that was already the introduction. Uh, any questions? Um, anything that uh, you have heard about support vector machines and want to address before we go into the meat? Yep. Uh, so the exercise, uh, I mean, should we have some submit that are results? Well, actually, it's more like um, I will talk a long time and maybe I will stop talking before four. I hope that I will stop talking before four. Um, and, um, and then um, the question is, what do you do until four? And um, then I suggest that you do the exercise and I will be around. I actually also solved the exercise. Uh, so I did a little bit more than I was usually able to do statistics. So um, you find also the code um, which I used to train SVMs using CVX opt. You find that so you can also look at the code. 
Um, I'm not interested in given, g getting any uh, reports. Um, so um, I know that you will, uh, there will be an exam, right? So I will be able to ask you questions about support vector machines. So you will study that. And then I think it just helps uh, a lot to study actually the code. So to be able to sort that. But yeah, no, I, there will, I, no, I don't want to look at any stuff. So I, I'm, I will be around and um, so later on and then we can, maybe some of you can show what they've done. But let's see, I don't know how good you are in machine learning. Just know how good you are in statistics. <laughs> good. Um, any other questions? No. Then, uh, sorry, I need to go to the. <laughs> okay, let's continue. So. Now, the first thing is to discuss the geometry of things, where the main uh, part is... Uh, could you please close the door? Thank you. Um, where, the main thing, um, where the main thing is to get from this intuitive um, notion of uh, you know, classification boundary in 2D space to the model that's actually um, doing that. Um, yeah, please interrupt if uh, something is unclear, yeah? Um, because, the, of course, there will be math, but so if you're not happy with if some of the symbols don't really make sense to you, um, make yourself known, um, then we can clarify it. So, the um, basic assumption here, or the basic starting point is um, that we have a training set, so that uh, there's a data set, and um, this data set uh, comprises um, n training examples. So there are n, if you want, data points, and each data point comprises um, a feature vector, so an m-dimensional feature vector, and um, a target variable. Um, why? Yeah, so the, um, in, of course, in everything that will uh, f uh, come up, I will always use the same notation and, and so on, so it's um, so that it makes sense. So um, yeah, um, the feature vectors, the m-dimensional feature vectors, which are these xi's, which are elements of the m-dimensional real number space, um, they. Yeah, are some I don't know some um, features of something, and um, then there's the target variable. And the important thing about the target variable is that it will always take on the values either minus one for one class or plus one for the other class. Not one and zero, but minus one and plus one. So that's important. Um, and um, m-dimensional feature vector can be anything. So maybe from what you have done, can you give an example where you used SVMs, and can you tell me what kind of feature vectors you used there? There were some people who used SVMs. So of those who used SVMs, what, what were the feature vectors? So what were the individual uh, entries of the feature vector representing and what were the target variables? I can't exactly remember, but I don't think there were minus one and plus one. I think there were like classifications of names. I don't think, did you use it on the IRIS data set? I'm not sure anymore. It's a, it's a couple of weeks ago. So did you use SVMs? <laughs> Good. And what did you classify there? And based on what? <laughs> Tumor cells. Okay. So there were tumor cells, so there were either cells that were not cells, uh, tumor cells and cells that were tumor cells, or there was some histology and it was either from a tumor or not from a tumor, what? Yeah, there's some information about the cells, mm -hmm. the cells and then we had to classify them to have malign or benign. Okay, and what was the information about the cells that you have had? The um, diameter and then the standard of um, deviation and so on. Okay, so there were... Size. So basically, there were quantifications of um, the size of these cells. Um, so that would be the entries in your. How many were there? Do you remember? So how many um, features you had? Hmm? Sixteen features. So the, you had sixteen numbers. 
uh, for each cell in your training set and which were these qualifications and then for each cell you had this um, label um, whether it's a tumor cell or not a tumor cell i guess and then you had um, how many training cells do you remember that a million or uh, i'm just trying to link what you did there with uh, the notation here Thousand. Thousand, okay. Yeah. Okay, so your M then would uh, would have been uh, 16. Your um, class label under the hood was minus one and plus one, although that would maybe was uh, benign or in malign um, then. And your N would be uh, 1000. Sometimes you have the same number of training action class for each um, class, but that's not necessarily the case, so I don't know whether you had 1000. Wasn't by the no. so, um, yeah, good. So then we have linked that to some actual problem. That's good. And of course, when we now talk about the visualizations, the visualizations that we're looking at are always in 2D. So that would uh, refer if you only had two uh, geometric features of these cells. Um, you did things in a 16-dimensional space, where it's of course harder or impossible to visualize things. But um, yeah, think always when we look at these 2D graphs that these are this the one could also do things in 1D so that you just have a line, but this looks a little bit too boring. So in 2D, um, that's easy to visualize. So that's why this is mostly used. 3D still works, um, but um, more than 3D is gets trickier because you definitely need more graphs for that. Good. So you've seen that. And the important thing is that um, what we're talking about now is the training set. So of course, the aim is always that you get a new cell and um, then you should make a prediction. Is this now a benign or a malign, is that the word? malign cell? Um, but uh, what we are talking about here is how to get the classification boundary from the training set. Yeah? So it's all about the training set. Good. Um, this is what we discussed. It's always minus one and plus one. Yeah, and here actually use an example of M clinical markers of uh, of M patients, but your example was not clinical markers, but geometric features of N uh, cells and two diagnosis uh, groups. Um, so this plus in front of the one is not really necessary, so I didn't have it in there. So you see that there, it's not there. But then you always see it when you see this about vector machine set. But anyway, now um, that's the training set, and we always assume that there is a training set. Um, and now we want to um, discuss um, how this classification comes about. And um, to this end, um, the notion of a linear discriminant function is important. So. We will um, yeah, frame um, support vector machines here for most of the part as um, linear classifiers so that they rely on linear discriminant functions. There are extensions of SVMs then under the name kernel methods to nonlinear uh, classifications, so we will um, briefly talk about it. But for the most part, um, the SVMs that we are discussing here are actually linear classifiers. Um, that then work with linear discriminant functions. So what is a linear discriminant function? Um, that's a multivariate real valued function of the form H, um, and they already made a mistake here. Um, that's, of course, a minus one. Um, that um, minus one to plus one. That maps um, each um, exemplar um, to um, a class label. No? And um, this mapping um, is done in um, two steps. The first thing is um, that there is um, a multivariate real value parameter, parameter dependent uh, affine function. So that's the function f, which takes um, um, a feature vector and maps it onto a real value. And it does so by multiplying um, the feature vector, so this m-dimensional thing, with an m-dimensional um, parameter vector w um, and adds to it um, a bias parameter w0. If you're familiar with neural networks, the treatments of this bias parameter versus the uh, parameter vector here is a little bit different. I uh, had hoped that um, I could, um, like in neural networks, um, just include this w0 um, in the weight vector and um, put a, a one into uh, some, an auxiliary one into the 
um, feature vector, but that doesn't quite work because uh, later on how things are then uh, translated and so on. So, um, um, so if you have the question whether we just can put the bias parameter into the weight vector, no, not really. I mean, in neural networks, that's always the case, but here not really. So we need to um, deal with the weight vector, m numbers, and um, the bias parameter, w0. And then, um, based on the output of this function f, which is just a real number, um, there is the function g, which makes up this function h, and um, this um, then is kind of the decision rule, if you want, um, or the classification um, function, which uh, doesn't have any parameters um, and maps the output of um, the function f onto the values minus 1 and plus 1. So here's correct and that's wrong. Um, where um, minus 1 is um, um, assigned if the value of the function f for the uh, feature vector x is smaller than 0 and um, um, plus 1 if the value of the function f uh, for the feature vector is larger or equal to 0. Um, so that's uh, a linear discriminant function. So it uh, requires these two functions, one just being this uh, um, linear affine function that is applied to the um, feature vector and is uh, weight um, dependent, parameter dependent, and then based on the output of this initial um, 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 affine function, um, the decision um, um, function to class or the, yeah, the classification into class minus one and class plus one based on whether the output of this um, um, function f is larger or equal to zero or smaller than zero. Yeah? Questions about this? No. Um, so if you um, if it's um, if you view this whole thing from a um, statistical modeling or from any kind of modeling perspective, um, the thing is uh, that of course the model has parameters and these parameters are the weights and the bias parameter. Um, and of course the aim of support vector machine training is to um, yeah, estimate, or no, I shouldn't say estimate because we're not in statistics, but to uh, um, obtain good guesses for these parameters to, I uh, can say, fit the parameters or whatever. Um, but uh, so these parameters, they have to be learned, learned because we're in machine learning, learned from the data, estimated based on the data. Um, now, this setup, um, so having a linear discriminant function which comprises both um, G and F, induces um, in feature space um, a decision boundary. And um, this is referred to as the hyperplane. This is this line that you always see in these two graphs. And this refers to the elements of feature space, so this X in uh, feature space, for which um, the um, outcome or the value of um, the linear affine function equals zero. Yeah. It also uh, induces a decision region um, d minus one. Um, these are all the feature vectors for which the um, function f takes on values smaller um, than zero and the decision region d plus one. These are the values for which the um, um, the affine function takes on values um, larger or equal to zero. So um, let's look at a picture. Um, this is the um, 2D example. What you always need to keep in mind now is that, um, sorry, that this function f is parameter dependent. Yeah? So depending on the weights and the bias, these decision boundaries are located uh, somewhere else in space, are, um, have a different tilt, and hence also the decision regions look different. Yeah? So you can uh, wiggle around um, this um, hyperplane or this decision boundary by changing the weights. That's the most important thing. And how to do that, that's what we're going to discuss. Um, so here's the example. Um, here, two-dimensional um, um, features. So each xi has, one, has two <laughs> values. And then the red ones have the yi minus one, the blue ones have the yi plus one. Um, and um, this is how they uh, came out here. And this, of, of course, it's a made up example. And um, this line here denotes those x uh, for which the value of this linear affine function equals zero. 
One proof that I didn't include, which I later on thought it would also be nice to include, is actually to show that if you have such a, um, a fine linear function um, as f is, mainly because it's the dot product of the um, weight vector and the feature vector um, plus the bias, that this actually corresponds to a hyperplane, so um, a, a plane of a dimensionality uh, um, of the feature space minus one. So if you're in 2D, um, you, um, you have a line. If you're in 1D, you have a point. If you're in 3D, you have a, um, actually a plane. Um, this um, I didn't include, so um, yeah, it's fairly trivial, so it follows um, directly from the way that um, this um, uh, function is defined, that it's a line. Because it could be anything, it could be also a circle or something. But um, because it's um, defined like this, if one, so that, that it really depends how one does it. So one, what one can do is um, to define what a hyperplane is um, using a, um, a vector um, a description of a hyperplane and then show that a vector description of a hyperplane um, is uh, equivalent um, to um, such a, um, a fine uh, function um, taking on the value zero. This is not included, but you can actually, for example, look that up, how this can be shown on Wikipedia, if you look into hyperplanes in Wikipedia. What we will uh, go more into detail about is how the weights determine what's going on with the hyperplane, because that's um, that's kind of the, the um, thing that um, is done during um, training. So you, uh, you change the weights in some way that this hyperplane does uh, uh, yeah uh, falls somewhere and that's um, what we're going to discuss um, what i put in addition on this slide is um, if you um, want to plot these hyperplanes it uh, it's helpful to translate um, um, this um, um, formulation of the hyperplane as a set of points into this coordinate wise or this um, function uh, formulation where x2 is a function of x1 um, and you need to basically multiply x1 by the ratio of um, the first weight um, and the second weight negative and subtract from it b0 times uh, uh, through um, divided by w2. So if you want to plot it um, in, in, in Python, for example, or wherever, um, you would um, use some um, values um, at the x-axis, lin space, and uh, then you can plot a line based on a certain setting of the weight parameters and the bias parameter by using this formula, which is just uh, reformulating that this equals zero, which in a way is also a way to show that this is a line, if you want. Questions about this? No. Good. So now um, the, the, this thing that I mean mainly by the geometry of linear discriminant functions um, and which is this the main content here of this first session, the question is how do the weights determine um, how the hyperplane is um, oriented and where it is located? Because we discussed that we want a large margin a hyperplane, but the question is how do we get the weights uh, to such uh, um, values that actually the hyperplane fulfills this uh, large maximum, uh, maybe even um, um, criterion. Um, because if you just uh, use some weights, um, so make them up, then you will get what I showed you earlier. So you get these uh, different hyperplanes. And of course, you can play with the weights um, yourself and then see how um, the hyperplane falls. But in the end, of course, you want to automatize that. So you need some a way to link um, the, the weights um, to um, the um, orientation and location of the hyperplane. And this is what I'm um, discussing here in this geometry of linear discriminant functions. So um, here we again assume that we have this um, um, affine function, which is part of the linear discriminant function, and we have um, the hyperplane. Um, and then one can show three important uh, properties, namely first, the weight vector is orthogonal to any vector pointing in the direction of the hyperplane. So if you want the weight vector is a normal vector on the hyperplane, which means, and this is very important, that if it's uh, because it's always like that, so th um, this is the weight vector and this is the hyperplane, if you change the weight vector, you change the hyperplane accordingly. Yeah? So that's um, because they are always on 90 degrees. Um, so they never uh, stop their orthogonality. So changing the weight vector shifts the hyperplane. 
um, in orientation definitely. Um, then another thing that is maybe a little bit less intuitive is that the minimal uh, Euclidean distance between um, a point in feature space and a point on the hyperplane, so a point that falls on this hyperplane line, is given by um, the output of this um, um, function f. And that's what maybe surprised me when I first started this uh, most. So there is, um, if the output of this function f is uh, larger for a given feature uh, vector, um, then um, this feature vector is further away from the hyperplane. And um, the last thing is, which is uh, a lot related to this, is that um, the distance um, of the hyperplane from the origin depends on the bias parameter. Um, so that's also surprising. I actually remember asking, so we had an introduction to linear discriminant functions way back in computational neuroscience and tubing in like 2004 or something. And uh, uh, yeah. What's his name? Malot. He gave the lecture, and I asked him. Uh, I didn't understand why this is the case, and I didn't really get an answer there. So for me, uh, I wasn't really quite clear why, clear why the bias parameter gives uh, this distance from the origin. Maybe you, if if, if who, to whom are these things clear, and you can justify why they happen. No, good. Then you're like me. Um, so this shows again what I just said as a picture. So the first thing that is important is that the weight vector, which we, of course, the weight vector has as many dimensions as the feature uh, vector, right? So the weight vector is always formed, uh, forming this uh, dot product with the feature vector in the function f. So um, the weight vector, if we are talking about uh, 2D, is also a 2D um, vector. And um, the uh, first thing, the first geometric property that is crucial is that the weight vector is always orthogonal to um, the um, hyperplane. So if you uh, change the orientation of the weight vector, you change the orientation of the hyperplane. And why that is, I will show you in a second. Um, the second thing is um, that, the, um, yeah, that the smallest distance from here, this feature vector x, to a point on the hyperplane, which you get by going uh, in 90 degrees here up um, to x, depends on the output of the function f. So that's the second um, thing. And um, the last thing is that the distance from the origin, so from 0, 0 to the hyperplane, is given uh, essentially by the bias parameter. So by changing, so what, what, why this is important is um, mainly uh, for this uh, two things, that if you change the weight vector, you change the orientation of the hyperplane, if you change the bias parameter, you change its um, location, um, so you can get, uh, get it to this direction if you increase the bias. So why do these things hold? Um, and um, this is what these uh, little proofs are about, which are relatively straightforward. So the first uh, thing is um, why um, is the weight vector always orthogonal to the hyperplane? And um, this one can show as follows. Uh, so if you have two points on the hyperplane, so xA and uh, xB, uh, so here actually this is also a little bit old. Uh, I at one point had these um, hyperplanes always um, labeled uh, with respect to a weight vector because you need to keep in mind that the hyperplane is dependent on the weight vector um, but then at one point I thought that's overkill of notation so that's still remnant of that so if xa and xb are both uh, on the hyperplane um, then um, of course the function f um, applied to xa and uh, the function f applied to xb both come out zero that's, uh, um, that's kind of the definition of the hyperplane. Um, now, if we subtract um, these from uh, one another, another then um, the um, bias parameter goes away, and um, we can basically take the um, w out, and uh, we see that um, the dot product of the weight vector with the difference of these two points um, um, on the hyperplane is zero. And then, um, <coughs> If you view the difference between these two dimensional points as a vector pointing into the direction of, of some kind of direction, then of course it points into the direction of the hyperplane, which means that uh, this vector here 
and this vector here are orthogonal to one another. And um, this is a vector, this xa minus xp, a vector pointing into the direction of the hyperplane. Yeah? So this is why um, the, um, or this is a way to show that the weight vector is orthogonal to the hyperplane. Meaning if, and this is, and the more important thing is not, yeah, the proof is interesting to see why this is happening, but the important thing is that we have this handle uh, on the hyperplane with the weight vector, yeah, again. So if we now change the weight vector, we sh uh, turn the hyperplane around. Yeah, questions? No? Good. Um, a little bit more involved is actually um, to show this relationship between the distance of a point in feature space um, to the output of this function f. Um, and a way that this, uh, one way this uh, can be addressed is to actually decompose a point uh, in feature space into its projection, so the, um, a point on the hyperplane and um, its um, distance um, to um, the hyperplane. So let me go back to this here. This is shown here. So the, we are talking now about this green um, point and um, we decompose uh, this, um, these coordinates in, in 2D by um, having this point here and adding to it um, the vector that goes from uh, here to here. Yeah? So we yeah, decompose um, this two uh, these two-dimensional coordinates into the sum of these two-dimensional coordinates plus um, the um, this uh, uh, thing here. Now um, the question is, what is this thing here? Well, we know that the weight vector is orthogonal um, to the hyperplane, so this definitely goes into the direction of the weight vector. Um, and so we have a um, vector pointing to this direction. We can, of course, um, normalize um, this vector by um, dividing by its uh, Euclidean uh, um, length, and um, so that we have a vector of length one, and then um, the distance um, from um, here to here is, um, um, so the distance and the direction uh, from here to here is this d, so the distance here, the Euclidean distance, times um, the weight vector divided by its uh, norm, so the uh, unit um, weight vector. Yeah? So meaning we can write x as xp plus uh, this uh, unit weight vector times this distance d. Yeah? Um, because the weight vector is always orthogonal, um, which we have already shown. So that's this uh, decomposition here. Um, and when we have this, um, um, yeah, so this is what I'm um, literally talking about here. So this works because uh, W is orthogonal to any point, uh, vector pointing in the direction of the hyperplane and um, um, the length of um, this thing here, this W divided by its norm um, is one. Yeah? And then you scale this one by the distance number D, so a scalar. Now, if we write x like that and then put x into the linear affine function, um, we get the following. So this is the f, how it's defined. Then we put in um, um, our um, decomposed uh, version here and uh, multiply out. So we get uh, wtxp plus um, um, w0 plus, where did this come from, wxp. Oh, I know that's just from the back, sorry. So, uh, um, so we do WXP, that's this, and then we have WT, uh, WTW uh, divided by the norm, and this plus uh, um, W0, so the bias I put here in the middle to confuse myself. Yeah? But I think the reason why I put it there is then because uh, you get to see that this is again um, the uh, something. Yeah, namely um, because um, xp, so look at xp again, xp is a point on the hyperplane. So for xp, uh, for wt xp plus uh, w0, um, this is uh, comes out zero because it's a point on the hyperplane and the hyperplane is defined by the fact that the uh, um, function f comes out zero. So what the only thing that remains is this um, uh, wt 
w, so the scalar product of the um, weight vector divided by its norm, times d. And um, then um, we know that um, the um, scalar product, um, the scalar product is the square of the norm. Um, so we get uh, one uh, norm um, out. So remember, the norm is the, um, the scalar product uh, square root, um, as I guess you know. So I hope you're all familiar with this notation. And hence, we get um, d times um, the norm of the weight uh, vector. And um, then we already have that the f of x is uh, d times the norm of the weight vector. Then we just put it on the other side, and then we have shown the property here. Yeah. And so what this shows is that, um, and that's the, the bottom line, and the most important thing about this thing is that um, the output of this function f, depending on the weight values, um, gives you um, the distance from the hyperplane. Questions about this? No. And then the last thing that's actually quite easy if one already established that, the question is now um, what is the uh, minimal distance of the origin to a point on the hyperplane? Um, well, um, to this end we take the origin and evaluate its distance. And um, then uh, the thing is for the origin, we of course, the origin is just given by a vector of zeros. So if we put uh, the origin into the function f, then um, we um, get um, zero um, for this um, scalar product, so for wt times x zero. Um, and the only thing um, that um, remains is um, the, oops, the weight, uh, uh, sorry, the bias parameter um, divided by its norm. And then there's the, um, the, then we have established the link between the, um, the bias parameter and the distance of the hyperplane from the um, origin. And this is again important. So if you think again, so the weight vector can tilt the hyperplane. And now with the bias parameter, we can also um, shift the hyperplane at a given orientation um, with respect to the origin. So we can move it around. Yeah? And then we can, um, we have now full control about the location of the hyperplane. Um, by manipulating the weights. Yeah. Um, so again, these are the crucial uh, things um, to understand how the weights and the bias parameter of a linear discriminant function determine the location of the um, hyperplane. Yeah. Now, um, before we can yeah, now train a linear support vector machine, we need uh, some more uh, definitions. Um, so the first thing is we already said that we want a, a margin or a large margin uh, of our classification boundary. So the question is, what is this hyperplane margin? And then also, uh, what is a support vector? When we talk about support vector machines, it might uh, make sense to discuss that. So we assume that we have a training set, and we assume that there's our function f um, with, that uh, takes the form f of x is wt x plus uh, w0. And um, we um, yeah, assume that there's this hyperplane induced by f. Then, um, we um, do one more thing, namely we um, uh, let um, di, so the absolute value of di, denote the absolute um, value of the minimal Euclidean distance of the training feature vector xi. So what we are actually, uh, um, actually doing here, let me just show you that, is that to each um, uh, training um, data feature vector, we uh, um, define its distance from the hyperplane. So that's the only thing. Yeah? So x4 uh, has distance d4 from the hyperplane, and we are interested in the absolute values because depending on which side they uh, are, these values are um, negative or uh, positive because the uh, function comes out negative or positive. So we take the absolute value to just have an absolute measure of the shortest distance from each, so the minimal distance from each uh, training um, um, feature vector to the hyperplane. Yeah? So these are the so these are the um, di. 
here. And these di we can write as follows. We have um, just shown that we can uh, write them as the output of the function f. And um, then, and this is also crucial, um, if the output is positive, then uh, the label is also positive. If the output of function f here, I mean, is negative, then yi is also negative. So we can uh, compute this absolute value by multiplying what we have inside the absolute value here uh, with the respective target label. Yeah? So this is where, because at one point these yi start to show up, and uh, they start to show up because um, they are carrying out this absolute uh, value um, uh, operation. And um, that's why they also need to be minus one and plus one and not uh, one and zero, because if they would be zero, then uh, you would have zero here all the time. And um, so that they really need to be minus one and plus one to carry out this absolute value um, thing. So that's um, now just the absolute distance of each training uh, feature vector from the hyperplane. And um, yeah, that's larger or equal to zero. Of course, it's um, um, zero if the um, feature, vec uh, feature vector lies on the hyperplane. Otherwise, it's larger or zero because it's an um, uh, absolute value. Um, now, what's the margin? The margin um, is uh, the minimum of all these absolute distances. Yeah? So the margin uh, d star uh, is the minimum over the uh, distances, which you can, if you um, just uh, look here, so for these uh, training data points, that's, the, that's a distance, 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 that's a distance. And one of these distances is the smallest distance. And in this case, this is the distance of the feature vector x2. And the margin is defined as this, um, um, as this smallest distance. Yeah. So it's, it's quite natural, um, so, um, so the margin is defined. You go straight out from the hyperplane, so in a 90-degree angle, and uh, somewhere you hit the first um, training feature vector, and when you hit the first training feature vector, that's um, what is defined as the margin. Uh, um, and this margin um, then gets kind of, um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of parameterized also um, by the weights because you can compute this uh, margin um, based on um, this formula. So if you want to change the margin, uh, so if you change the weight, you also uh, change the margin. I mean, it's if you change the weight and the bias parameter, which is quite clear. I mean, if you um, now would change the bias parameter and shift the uh, hyperplane a little bit around, um, then of course at one point, maybe if you shift it over here, um, the margin would actually be um, related to um, this distance for here. Um, yeah, and then the definition of the margin comes also with the de definition of the support vector. So um, a training set feature vector, so a training set feature vector is referred to as a support vector if its absolute distance from the hyperplane corresponds to the margin. So if it's on the margin, and then it's called a support vector. So meaning um, this uh, x2 here is a, a support vector for this hyperplane. You can have multiple support vectors if you have um, them located uh, essentially in parallel with respect to the uh, hyperplane, then you have multiple support vectors. Um, but uh, you have at least uh, one support vector because one of the feature vectors will be closest to um, the hyperplane. So that's the definition of the support vector. Questions about definition of hyperplane margin and support vector? No? Good, and then we are almost done with the ge geometry. One thing um, that I haven't uh, addressed so far is that the way that um, the hyperplanes are specified so far is uh, yeah, if you want ill post or under de ill determined or underdetermined um, because if you take a scalar multiple of the weight vector um, and the bias uh, parameter then you get to the same hyperplane so this uh, you can see uh, as follows so um, um, yeah if you um, so um, 
the hyperplane plane is determined by the function x taking on the value zero. Now, um, if you multiply both sides of this equation by a, then of course this still holds. And uh, multiplying the function f um, means you multiply the weight and the bias parameter by a scalar multiple. Um, and you also get zero. Yeah? So that means that if you, for example, have a hyperplane and your weight parameters are one and two and your um, bias parameter is three, then if you use one, two and three as weights and uh, bias parameter, you might as well, you get the same hyperplane um, if you use um, two, um, four and six as uh, weights and bias parameters. So all these uh, hyperplanes are actually equivalent, equivalent in the sense that um, they, the same hyperplane uh, can be described by uh, s different settings of um, the weights. Yeah? So it's not a bijective mapping from the location and orientation of a hyperplane to the weights. So somehow if you want to, um, you need to, um, uh, to have kind of a unique specification of a hyperplane with one set of weights, so to have a bijective mapping between weights, a bias parameter and hyperplane location, you need to do something. And what they have uh, chosen to do is um, that um, a support vector, um, the, the distance, um, um, the distance, the absolute, uh, wait, wait a second, so what they have done is um, to um, say that for a support vector, the um, output, so the um, output of the function f, so the absolute, uh, sorry, the output of the function f, so the absolute value of that, meaning the distance, um, should be one. So what this means is you should, um, um, you can um, have the same hyperplane and many different uh, values of the weights and the bias parameters that give you the same hyperplane. Now you should select those weights and this bias parameter such that um, the support vector has an absolute distance from the hyperplane being equal to one. Yeah? So meaning that, um, for example, you can use, so to have this line, you can have um, the, I'm just talking about the weights now, you can have the weights one, two, um, two, four, um, three, uh, six and so on, all described uh, by this uh, um, um, by this hyperplane. Now, um, for when you choose change the weight vector, the value of a point uh, uh, with respect to this um, hyperplane, um, so the distance changes. And um, in terms of uh, getting a unique weight representation, uh, what you should do is uh, take those weights for which the distance of um, the support vector is one. Yeah, so you should scale the weights essentially. So a, a different way to do that would be to um, um, scale the weights and the bias parameter to always uh, be of length one. So to scale the weights vector, that would be one thing. And this is not what they are doing here, but they um, scale them such that a support vector has a distance of one from the hyperplane. Yeah? Um, but this uh, gets around basically having these um, uh, not well determined uh, weight and bias parameters for the same hyperplane. Um, but this then um, means um, that uh, the margin of um, and, and using these weights or using these weights um, for the hyperplane means uh, is then referred to as the canonical hyperplane. Um, now because the distance from a support vector to the hyperplane is called the margin, um, the, um, the uh, size of the margin, so um, this length from a support, uh, so this distance from a support vector to the hyperplane um, is um, um, given by um, one divided by um, the norm of the weight vector because um, the, um, because we defined it like that. Uh, let me show what I was. So um, in principle, um, we would have, um, so in principle, this would be um, <coughs> our um, distance. Um, but um, because we choose this weight representation that um, refers to a canonical um, um, uh, hyperplane, this distance is defined to be one, 
uh, and hence the um, margin um, is of this size, one divided by the weight vector norm. Picture? No, don't have a further picture. Um, so um, again, uh, stated differently, um, the margin um, is uh, the minimal um, distance of feature vectors uh, from the hyperplane, and um, this minimal distance is um, 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 set to 1 over the um, norm of the weight vector. Please ask, because I don't think I get clear at this point. So um, again, here maybe it's a way to show this again. So this is the distance of a, a point um, from um, the hyperplane, uh, of a feature vector from the hyperplane. And it's normally it's d uh, equals 1 over the norm of the weight vector times the output of the function. But now the uh, function weights are determined for a support vector such that the output of the function is 1. And then uh, the distance of a um, um, support vector from the hyperplane, which is the same as the margin, is 1 over the norm of the weight vector. Well, I think that's maybe a bit clearer now. Good. Um, These are the geometric properties that I wanted to discuss. So um, this would be then a good time for a break. Um, and yeah, so again, the important th so there are two main important things. One is the weight vector determines the orientation and the location of the uh, hyperplane, um, and the um, margin um, is um, given by one over the weight vector. So the weight vector, so the norm. That's another way to say it. The norm of the weight vector also determines the margin. Yeah. Good, then let's have a break and uh, meet again in half an hour, I guess, in the other building. Hello! Now I don't see anyone anymore because they are all behind computer screens, but that's fine with me because I never look up anyway. Um, has there been some dropout? Or is it me that feels there has been some dropout? In any case, um, we are now oops, uh, continue once the phone ended. So what we've established so far again is essentially how to ah, let's go all the way back, how to control the location and the um, orientation of such a classification line in um, feature space. Yeah? And we've learned how we can do this um, by um, manipulating the weight, or essentially what we learned is that the weights are, um, and the bias parameter are a means to control that. So the question still is, if we go back to um, um, this here, um, we've now seen that if we set some weights, we will get something like this, like this, or like this. Um, but we haven't really uh, talked about how we ge get the optimal weights in the sense that these are the weights that give us a large margin. So the topic then for the next, uh, I don't know, not that long, even 20 minutes or so, is to um, discuss support vector machine training as an um, optimization problem and um, to link this um, intuition of uh, the hyperplane and space with a thing that is computable in the sense that we can formulate as a problem that we can give to some um, optimization routine. So um, before we do that, um, two definitions about linearly and nonlinear separable training set. Um, a training set D is called linearly separable training set if a linear discriminant function can be found such that all training point uh, training points are classified correctly. 
So if you um, think of um, these clouds of dust that we've seen, um, as soon as you can find a line that you can put through it um, so that um, all the blue dots are on the one side of that line and all the red dots are on the other side of the line, um, then this is called linearly separable. Um, however, it's still, of course, not necessarily clear which is the best of these lines that you can uh, put uh, through there because you could shift it a little bit, and tilt it a little bit and it still would classify correctly everything. Um, a training set D is non-linear separable um, if um, no such linear discriminant function can be found um, so that all the training points are classified correctly. And you can, of course, have both. And uh, it's, of course, more likely that um, in real data applications, your training set is uh, uh, non-linearly separable, meaning that um, However you tilt and, and shift a, a hyperplane around, um, you will never get a performance of 100% correct uh, classification in your training data set. Yeah? Did you look at your training data set performance when you did your uh, experiment? I mean, you definitely looked at the generalization, but did you look at what you got in terms of correctly classifying the training data after training? Was it 100% or was it less? You didn't look at it. <laughs> oh, well. Um, so, yeah, these are just two, um, two uh, scenarios. We are not going to um, now in detail try to figure out how we can tell whether a training data set is uh, linearly separable or not. We just uh, go with the intuition that um, we either can find a line so that we get 100% uh, correct classification on the training uh, set data um, or not. And uh, what we're setting up is a training of the weights for both uh, cases. Because in the former case, in the case of a linearly separable training set, this idea of a maximum margin um, yeah, is uh, somewhat uh, yeah, better defined than in the case where it's not linearly separable because um, then the, you will get some errors and then uh, you would do something that is called soft margin um, 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 classification. So let's uh, get started. So um, we assume now that we have a linearly separable training set um, so that um, we can find a weight uh, vector and uh, a bias parameter for this training set that we get a uh, hundred percent correct classification on training. Um, now what um, does it then mean to do maximum margin mas margin classification and um, uh, maximum margin SVM training? Well it means that we um, want to minimize um, the square of the norm of the weight vector times one half, but this one half is just um, so that if you compute derivatives, the, this two um, gets multiplied uh, with one half and it goes away, so this one half doesn't really matter. Um, subject to the constraints that the product of each um, target variable um, times the output of the um, function f for our training um, feature vector xi um, is equal or larger to 1 for um, a 1 uh, to n. So why, where does this now come from? Um, so the, um, so I'm, I'm telling you now that um, estimating or obtaining the parameters that give you a maximum margin classification um, you can get by solving this constraint minimization problem. So where does it come from? Two things. The first thing is that we want to minimize um, this uh, norm, which is of course um, the same as maximizing one over the norm, which, um, as we've seen um, before the break, um, corresponds to um, the margin. Um, and um, the idea is that we maximize this margin by adapting the weight parameter accordingly. The second thing is that um, we have these uh, inequality constraints, namely that the product of the um, um, target um, variables times the output of the um, function f for each of the training uh, vectors, it's larger or equal to one, which uh, corresponds to the fact that either 
each uh, training vector should be a support vector, that's for the equality of one, or larger, meaning that it should be on the correct side of the hyperplane margin. So here's a, a picture of um, a linearly uh, separable uh, training data set. So you have this one class here, this other class here. Um, obviously, you can uh, put a line through it so that um, all the red dots are on the left of that line and all the blue dots are on the right of that line. Um, and now um, to specify the weights or to, to get the weights that represent, for example, a line like that, um, the aim is to minimize um, the weight vector norm, to, which corresponds to maximizing uh, the margin um, under the constraints um, that um, the output of the um, linear affine function times the target variable is larger or equal to one, because by definition, um, the distance from um, a point on the hyperplane to um, a support vector is equal to one. Yeah? That's actually important. Questions about this? So you, one way to view this is um, if you think about, <laughs> which you might not want to do, but if you think about uh, this uh, from a statistics perspective, um, where you, uh, we have this criterion of maximum likelihood, and uh, we um, basically had this objective function, which uh, was uh, the log likelihood of the data and the parameters were determined, uh, or the optimal parameters in this setting were, det uh, were constrained by the fact that they maximize um, the log likelihood. Um, and that was the idea there. Here the idea is that the parameters are determined by maximizing the uh, margin, which corresponds to minimizing the norm of the weights from all the geometry that uh, we've done before, and um, that, um, the, um, that we get 100% classification on this linearly separable training set by all of the feature vectors then to fall um, either on the margin as a support vector or um, further out. Yeah. So, um, in principle, um, if you um, yeah, got, learned a little bit of uh, nonlinear optimization, you will already see that this goes into the direction of typical formulations of nonlinear optimization problems. And we will talk more about this. Um, before we do that, um, the idea of soft margin classification, because this relates then closely to things in support vector machines that immediately come to mind of any user of support vector machines, namely the C parameter. How do I set C? Did you set C in your um, exercise? Was there something about a C parameter? seems to be some uncertainty about this exercise. In any case, um, that was maximum margin classification leading to this nonlinear constraint uh, um, optimization uh, problem, and now soft margin classification, um, which leads to a slightly different uh, nonlinear um, optimization problem, but also with constraints. So we now assume that um, no such function can be found that we get 100% correct uh, classification on the training data. Um, so if you want, not even on the training data. So this shows an example, although I didn't quite try, but you see that this blue dot is really uh, deep in the, um, in the cloud of the red dots. So um, it's really, um, I mean, I didn't really try, but I, I would assume that it's really not possible to find a straight line that gets also this dot um, on the correct uh, side and also this um, red dot on the correct side of the uh, tr um, hyperplane, regard uh, irrespective of where you put the hyperplane and how you tilt it. So we assume that we have a, a not necessarily linear separate training set, and um, we're talking about um, soft margin classification. Now, in soft margin classification, we deal uh, with the following constraint optimization problem. So we want to minimize, again, the squared norm of the weight vector, which, cause, uh, again, corresponds to maximizing uh, the um, margin. And um, we want to minimize, uh, with respect to these xi variables, so-called slack variables, the sum of the slack variables and um, we want to um, yeah, um, basically weight 
each objective by this parameter c. Again, um, we have um, inequality constraints, namely that the output of the function f should be equal to larger, uh, uh, should be equal or larger than one, minus uh, um, uh, um, feature specific, a uh, feature um, vector specific select variable ci. So um, these ci, there are as many select variables as there are um, um, feature vectors, training data points. Um, and um, these, all of these uh, C, so here together in the vector, are constrained to be larger or equal to zero. So they should not be um, um, negative. So what, what is this about with the select uh, variables? Um, this is what is um, basically uh, written down here. So there are basically um, three options for what kind of values these select variables can take on. So um, if the select variable ci for a training um, data point is zero, then of course we are just uh, back here. Yeah? So if here minus ci uh, goes away, then we're back here. And again, this was the constraint that um, the um, training data points lie on the correct side of the um, hyperplane and at least uh, at a distance of one margin. Then we have um, the possibility that uh, Xi is between zero um, and one, so it uh, must be um, um, it must be positive. So it can only be uh, between zero and one or larger than one. If um, it's between zero and one, then um, we still have um, correct classification because um, the um, um, distance. Um, um, because the distance between um, the, mar um, the between the margin and um, which would be the case if ci is zero um, and um, the hyperplane is one, so if it goes into the wrong direction, if it's below one, it's still on the correct side. I will show you the um, picture in a second. And finally, we can have um, the case that um, we um, have misclassification if the C is actually larger than one, then we are on the wrong side of the hyperplane. But what you need to keep in mind here is that the aim is to minimize these slack variables. Yeah? So ideally, all the slack variables are zero, then we have complete um, um, correct classification. Maybe if that's not possible, they are a little bit larger than zero, but they are still, um, 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 the hyperplane is oriented and, and situated such that um, the classification is still uh, correct. If the C cannot be minimized uh, CI uh, uh, further than some uh, value, um, so for specific training exemplars, of course, um, then we might actually not get full 100% um, um, correct performance on the training data. Which, of course, if it's not linearly separable, we have to um, um, yeah, um, accept. So this um, shows um, um, the um, picture um, for this. So um, before we wanted a complete correct classification, which would mean that the distance from of each tra training uh, data feature vector um, to the hyperplane is larger than um, one, so at the margin or larger. Now we are allowing for some slack um, in the sense that um, if um, oh, here to both um, cases that um, the C is um, larger than one, then you see that um, the classification of this blue dot or of this red dot would be wrong. So there is some error. Um, what is not really shown is if you would have a blue dot here where I now put uh, the hand, then um, the C would be, or the CI for this, uh, um, the select variable for this training uh, feature um, vector would be um, between zero and one. Yeah? Again, overall, we're trying to align the um, hyperplane such that um, these CIs are minimized. So ideally we have very little misclassification and we have a very few um, 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 training data uh, points that are closer to the hyperplane than the margin, 
but because it's not linearly separable, that's our constraint, and we try to find the best uh, weight parameters and bias parameters such um, and select variables such that this is um, um, such that over the entire training set we still get um, yeah very uh, few select variables that are larger than zero and um, very few select variables that are um, between. Um, zero and one. Now this C essentially is um, the um, training parameter. Uh, sorry, the, the um, yeah training parameter, but it's also the, um, the trade-off parameter. Um, so you um, try to minimize uh, the entire sum of these select variables, and then you can also not um, um, change whether you um, take select variables to, to a certain power, so how strong you. Um, 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 penalize um, a slack larger than zero um, and then you get different names for these um, loss functions um, so if you have the square then it's, for, then it's called squared loss um, and if you have um, um, k being one then it's called hinge loss um, yeah so the um, so that's what's in there so a setting um, in support vector machine uh, training setting c and set, setting k are three parameters of your um, analysis and of course you can set them to a certain value and then um, decide and, and look at the training performance or even look at, uh, um, at generalization performance and then uh, change that so that uh, you get better prediction so it's a free parameter um, yeah but that's a soft margin classification which is applicable in, uh, in the case that um, linearly uh, separate uh, or full maximum margin classification is not possible. Yeah? So again, ideally, um, or the, the easy case is that it's uh, fully linearly separable, then you, um, the hyperplane is adjusted such that uh, the margin is maximized and done. If uh, the training set is such that um, this is not possible at all um, because the training data set is just not uh, linearly separable, this is not possible, then uh, the idea is to say, okay, we still want maximum margin, um, so we still want to minimize that, but we allow for a little bit of slack in the sense that um, yeah, sometimes maybe they are closer to the margin and sometimes maybe they're even wrong, but we try to minimize this misclassification. Yeah? Good. Um, so these are then the um, two um, typical um, optimization problems that need to be solved um, to um, learn the parameters of a support vector machine. Questions? No. Good. So the next bit then, so in principle, we would now be done and we would uh, use essentially this, uh, these constraint uh, sets, uh, sets of op optimization problems to train SVMs. Turns out um, that um, Vapnik, because he had a lot of time between the 60s and the late 90s, um, thought uh, maybe one can do a little bit more and um, make it a little bit more complicated if you want, but on the other hand also make it simpler in the sense that you can easily transfer this um, to first of all quadratic programming uh, problems um, and the other thing to, um, to invent something like kernel methods. So the basic motivation as I see it, so I'm not quite sure whether that was the motivation, but the basic motivation that uh, I think um, lies behind um, turning this into a quadratic programming problem was okay we have this um, but now we um, don't want to um, write our own code to um, um, solve this so let's look at what kind of uh, software solutions there are to solve quadratic programming problems um, and um, if we want uh, quadratic programming problems we first have to reformulate this uh, properly into a quadratic programming problem and the way that this is done is that it's actually transferred to, uh, transformed to its dual problem. And if you look at the dual problem, you actually also see the origins of kernel methods. So in the next kind of half an hour, 
I will um, first tell you about some foundations of constraint optimization that are general and are not related to um, uh, SVMs and then um, come back to SVMs um, to um, formulate SVM training as a quadratic program. Um, yeah, as a quadratic program. The other thing is that if you read, um, the other reason why I'm bringing, putting in these foundations of constraint optimization is if you read the SVM literature or these intros in these books about SVMs, is that as long as these geometric features are discussed, everything is fine because that's kind of self-contained. But at one point, uh, then usually in these books it says, um, so this is, the, um, this is the primal problem, what I've just shown you. And this can be written as a, a dual problem as follows, and then you get a new equation. And uh, this is then solved. And the question is, where does this new equation come from? It's actually the same. So this um, maximum margin classification and this dual form, that's in the paper by Bosa, 1992. But that's also in this way. So it's first discussed a little bit um, what, what a linear discriminant is. And then uh, suddenly it says, well, the dual problem is this. And look, here we have kernels. And it's not uh, explained further. The soft margin is from this 1995 paper. Um, so um, it helps to in understanding support vector machines. It helps to uh, know a little bit about constraint optimization. The other thing about constraint optimization is that it's very important in general for data scientists because in the end, all the methods that you learn about involve uh, tuning models to some data and that always involves some objective function, for example, a log likelihood, and then uh, maximizing or minimizing um, this objective function um, with respect to um, yeah, some parameters and um, often under constraints because the parameters are only allowed to take certain values. So if um, you have the opportunity in your data science course to take a course on nonlinear programming, nonlinear optimization, things like that, and do it. Who has done a course on nonlinear optimization? No one. So please do it. Yeah, it's very important. It's very important. Because in the end, this is always where the, the methods uh, go um, in terms of uh, data um, analysis. Good, but the good thing is that nobody has done something like that, so I, it makes sense that I somehow now start from the uh, basics in constraint optimization. Any questions before we go into this? No. Good. So we are now basically taking some uh, excursion, or is that a word? So an excurs. Um, so we stop in SVMs and uh, deal now with a um, different topic to use then what we learn about this different topic later on on SVMs. So uh, the first thing when we now talk about constraint optimization is what is constraint optimization and actually everything that i do here is based on this Noxedal and wright book um, which is a very good book on um, nonlinear optimization together with uh, this cv ox python a convex optimization routine there's also a book called convex optimization by Vandenberger and, and, and so on this is also good, but I found the not so dull even better. Um, yeah, and you should also know that in machine learning there is a heavy interest in optimization. Yeah, so the I remember when I was at the machine learning summer school in 2006, I think in Tübingen, 2006 or 2007. Um, Vandenberger was also there and presented an optimization. I didn't quite get why there was now somebody suddenly just talking about optimization and not Bayesian methods as everybody else was. Um, and the reason was that it's for support vector machines, you need all of this optimization. And in general, you need it. Good. So what is a constraint optimization problem? A constraint optimization problem has this general form. You have a function that is usually multivariate and real valued. And you want to minimize this function over um, its input um, space um, subject to certain um, constraints. And uh, usually there are two types of constraints, namely equality constraints. So you have function ci of x that um, are equal to zero. Of course, they can be equal to some other value. Then you would just subtract this other value and put into the function ci. Um, 
the e here are, are part of an index set e for equality constraints and you have inequality constraints um, which are um, specified by function ci where the i is in this inequality constraint uh, constraints um, index set um, the function f is uh, called the objective function um, and these um, ci where the i is in the equality index set are called equality constraints and the ci are inequality uh, constraints if the i is in this i set um, the set of all those uh, x which satisfy the equality and the inequality constraints is referred to as the feasible set so for um, minimizing the function with respect to x you have certain x which are actually allowed and uh, or are called feasible because they satisfy the constraints and others uh, uh, that are not allowed and hence infeasible um, now in optimization this is of course nonlinear optimization is just the extension of what you have been doing since uh, high school namely finding minima or maxima or settle points of uh, functions the generalization of this to um, functions that are more complicated than the functions that you dealt with in school yeah. um, and the way this minimization maximization works in nonlinear optimization is essentially the same way as uh, it worked in school namely you establish necessary and uh, sufficient conditions and uh, based on those you um, solve for um, the optimal values um, so you know from the school of course and from everything that um, if you have an unconstrained uh, um, um, problem um, and maybe even um, just a, a univariate function then um, the necessary condition for a minimum is that the derivative of the function in this location is zero and that the second derivative of this function at this location is larger than zero yeah so this you know since uh, school so um, what you always did is you computed the derivative and um, set it to zero and solved and then you checked um, for whether the second derivative is larger than zero or smaller than zero equal to zero and then it would be a settle point so this logic this logic that you are familiar with uh, from school um, is the mm. same um, in um, nonlinear constraint optimization only that it gets a little bit more involved essentially um, you already know i think that um, if you go from a univariate real value function to a multivariate real value function then the necessary condition does not only involve the derivative uh, anymore but it involves the derivative for multivariate functions which is the gradient um, um, and here it should say the gradient is equal to zero so that's another typo here where do i have my pen Hmm, maybe I left it in the other room. That would not be good. So then I have to look for it later. So um, this would be um, uh, the gradient being equal to zero um, is as the necessary condition and the Hessian matrix at the location of the uh, minimum being a positive semi-definite. So that's the extension of the second derivative. Um, and what we will um, discuss now is um, equivalent conditions to that for the case um, of constraint minimizers yeah because um, this kind of uh, computing the first derivative setting to zero um, and maybe checking the second derivative of course doesn't um, account for any constraints that there might be on the values of x because that x, in the sense that this minimizer is only allowed to occur at uh, specific locations yeah, questions about this general constraint optimization problem. The basic finding then in constraint optimization is that um, in general things are nice if you have um, convex uh, functions like the square function that have a uh, um, nicely defined um, global minimum on a, um, on a given feasible set, then things are easy. If this is not the case then the whole thing might not work um, 
one of the settings where it's easy uh, are quadratic programs. And um, this is now an example for a constraint convex optimization problem. Um, and it's uh, then usually specified like this. Um, minimize over the n-dimensional values x um, this um, objective function here, which is given by xt, so the transpose of x times um, um, strictly positive definite matrix P that needs to be specified uh, times X. So you have um, this square of X here plus uh, um, a linear term in X, so this QT times X. Um, so that's the objective function of a quadratic program. Um, it's a little bit weird. They call these things then program. Um, it's a problem, yeah, but um, historical reasons it's called program. Um, and um, the um, constraints then are usually um, yeah, specified also in terms of matrices. So um, you have the constraints Ax uh, being equal to B, which is the same, of course, as Ax minus B uh, being equal to zero. And you have, um, for example, I have a reason why I do this with the minus Gx plus H. You could also do um, um, larger than equal to zero. You could also do um, um, Gx plus plus h smaller or equal to zero. I did it this way because I just defined that the equality constraints are like this, but actually I forgot to also apply this here, so that should be as here. Anyway, a quadratic program um, is um, a constraint optimization problem where the uh, objective function and the constraints uh, take specific forms, and these specific forms are then defined, and this is the important thing. Also, if you want to do uh, support vector machine training later, they are defined by um, a matrix P, um, a vector Q, another matrix A, another um, vector B, another uh, matrix G, and another vector H. So if you have looked into CVX opt already, uh, and for this uh, quadratic programming solver, you will see that if you want to use this quadratic programming solver, you need to specify P, Q, A, B, G, and H. And for, basically for the rest of uh, today, we will figure out how to translate this maximum margin support vector machine uh, training into um, a set of matrices and vectors P, Q, A, B, G, and H, such that if we put them into CVX opt, we get out the weights and the um, bias parameter for our SVM based on some training set. Yeah, that's what I just said. So um, standard optimization libraries usually contain quadratic programming solvers. Um, and why we're discussing that, I also said, because it relates to kernel methods. Well, we're not going to discuss, and maybe you're waiting for that, but we're not going to discuss actual methods for minimizing functions. We're just discussing everything on this level of problem formulation, um, and then this dual problem formulation and uh, necessary conditions for minima and so on, but not uh, real algorithms that um, do that. You know that there are algorithms like gradient-based algorithms that uh, use the gradient to go into specific directions and um, that there are many other methods. For example, we've seen the newton raphson method in statistics. A little bit, this is not that important, actually. Um, um, what are actually, if we have these problems or programs, what are solutions? Well, one can um, distinguish um, um, local, strict local, and isolated local uh, solutions. That's actually not that important for the remainder. Um, strict local solution would be that is really smaller than all the other points in the environment. Local solution would be that is um, where the function takes on a value that is uh, smaller or equal to other points, so whether you have multiple uh, points that uh, where the minimum actually is happening. Um, and isolated local is that if there's a neighborhood that there's only one local solution. And just on the next slide, there will be uh, something referring to the solution, and um, this is just to um, yeah, have the idea of a solution um, established. This is not that important. Now, um, if you want um, to solve constraint optimization problems, you need to, um, or the way it's uh, then always done, is using um, a Lagrange function. We will dis discuss that here on a little bit of a higher level. So if you play around, if you have something where you try to find the minimum and you have some, const some constraints, you will find that you sometimes can solve this by elimination. So you get rid of certain things and then you can find it. But that's uh, always a little bit of kind of a uh, um, 
um, ad hoc fashion. Um, and it can be always be equivalent to actually dealing with the uh, um, minimization of the Lagrange function. So who has heard the term Lagrangian function and Lagrange multipliers before? Okay, some people have heard that before. So in principle, if you have seen this before, then you um, also would have heard something about constraint optimizations, optimization because that's where it's happening. Um, so what is the uh, Lagrangian function and what are Lagrange multipliers? So um, assume that you have a constraint optimization problem. So you want to minimize some function f um, over x uh, subject to some um, equality constraints and some inequality constraints. Um, then um, if you have these constraints, um, the Lagrangian function of this problem is defined as um, a function of uh, x and a vector lambda. Um, and this function is given by the original function, so this original objective function, and the sum, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, I'm subtracted from it, the sum of all um, uh, constraints um, multiplied by a parameter lambda i. So that's the um, definition of the Lagrange function. Um, and um, this uh, vector lambda is uh, referred to as Lagrange multiplier vector here, and the individual entries of this Lagrange multiplier vector are called Lagrange multipliers. Yeah. So far this is just the definition. Why do we need this? Because, and this is the important thing, um, the Lagrange function can be used um, to specify a necessary condition for the um, um, for the optimal solution. Yeah. So in principle, you can express the whole thing about this Lagrange multiplier business uh, as follows. So normally, if you wouldn't have uh, constraints, you would uh, do um, compute the derivative of the function and set to zero and solve. Now, if you have constraints, what you do is formulate the Lagrange function compute the derivative of the Lagrange function set to zero and solve. Yeah? So um, you basically just um, to account for the constraints, um, you apply the same logic that you would apply to the function if there weren't any constraints to the Lagrange function. So that's the basic um, idea. I'm not obviously not showing uh, why this uh, works. I'm just saying that this is, this is how it works essentially. Um, because using the Lagrange function, one can now give um, the so-called first order or the first order necessary condition for the solution of a constraint optimization problem, um, which are also referred to, and we heard that already today, as uh, karush kuhn tucker conditions. So these karush kuhn tucker conditions um, are the generalization of the first derivative is zero in an unconstrained simple problem. To, the, uh, to a scenario of a constrained um, multivariate uh, problem. Yeah? So you know the necessary condition at, uh, at where, uh, at the location of a minimum, the first derivative is zero. Now we have at the, solu um, at the location of a minimizer, so an x that minimizes the function and also satisfies the constraints um, that uh, so the inequality and equality constraints at this location the following hold and what are the following? Um, the following are that there is um, a Lagrange uh, multiplier uh, lambda star um, such that um, first of all the um, gradient of the Lagrange function with respect to x equals um, zero so that's this thing instead of um, setting the derivative to zero, you set the derivative of the Lagrange uh, function to zero. Um, then um, the um, equality constraints are satisfied. Um, so um, the um, uh, equality constraints at the location C star um, come out as zero, the inequality come out as larger than zero. I mean, this is what they should. So um, at a, this is not that uh, special. I mean, it's just saying that um, at a location where the uh, con, um, of a minimum that solves this constraint problem, the constraints are um, 
respected. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a, a constrained solution. Um, more interesting then is that the um, Lagrange multipliers are um, zero or positive, and um, that um, if um, this I have to say correctly, um, that if um, here the lambda um, um, star i is actually non-zero, so it's larger than zero, um, then the um, equality constraint um, or the inequality constraint uh, is satisfied as being zero. So then if, um, if there's a um, Lagrange multiplier that is larger than zero, then uh, the corresponding inequality or quality, uh, inequality or um, equality constraint uh, is um, um, taken on or active. That's how it's always called. So it's actually for this um, location, then it's actually zero. So um, these are so the way you should read this is if I, um, so normally what you would do is you have x squared, so you compute the derivative. So you have 2x and set to zero. And then you solve. And here, computing uh, 2x and set to 0 comes down to computing the gradient of the Lagrange function, setting to 0, writing down the um, constraints at this location, and, uh, and um, having the constraint that the Lagrange multipliers are larger than 0 and if they are or equal to 0, and if they are actually uh, um, larger than that the constraints are taken on. Yeah, so this just formulates necessary conditions. And then you need to find a way to solve that. Like when you have um, x square, um, the derivative co corresponds to 2x equals 0. Well, then it's, e um, 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 then it's easy um, because you just uh, divide by 2 and then you find that x equals 0. So this kind of solving you still have to do after writing down the necessary conditions. So that's the logic here. The whole story is a little bit more complex because there are certain regularity conditions um, that uh, I didn't uh, introduce, and these are called couch kuhn conditions. They are not that old, so that's more like 50s, 60s math, actually. Um, yeah, and that this is actually that at a location of a minimum, this Lagrange multiplier exists and these conditions are fulfilled. This is actually proven in Not So Done and Right. Uh, it involves Farkas Lemma, um, and you can read all about why this is happening. Good. So that was um, the necessary condition for a uh, um, minimum. So essentially, this is a kind of a starting point where you can, um, on, based on which you can identify the minimum. So again, for example, if you think about doing it numerically, um, if you do numerical minimization, um, then you could, of course, always um, put take your um, value or your argument uh, with respect you want to minimize a function, evaluate the derivative. If the derivative is larger than zero, you go somewhere else, maybe just randomly. Um, and at one point uh, you find that the derivative is zero, and then you know, okay, here um, I have an, either an extremum or a set point, and then I can check in the second derivative. And the same thing you can do numerically here. So you basically uh, change around um, the um, lambda and the x, um, and uh, once you somewhere in your um, input argument space uh, x and lambda you find that all these conditions hold which you just for a chance then you're happy because then you know this must be a minimum yeah it's all very simple um, yeah, so that was the primary problem and basically how it can be solved. Now, support vector machines, because Wapnik had a lot of time, um, involve the dual problem. And um, this um, then is an introduction to this idea of a dual problem. So the primal problem so um, is the constraint optimization problem that we've already seen. Yeah, This we now call the primal problem. There is uh, for each, or you can for a primal problem, you can formulate a dual problem. And the idea, the basic idea is that um, a solution of the dual problem is also a solution of the primal problem. Um, and um, solving the dual problem might be easier than solving the primal problem. So that's the basic motivation. Yeah? So um, 
of course, if solving the primary problem is easy, then there's no reason to deal with the dual problem. If um, it turns out that the dual, solving the dual problem is a lot easier than solving the primary problem, then of course this makes sense. So um, what is the dual problem? Again, we assume that we have a, a constraint nonlinear optimization uh, problem, and now we just uh, take into account, I just did that because it's uh, in the not so and right done like that, um, we um, only take into account inequality constraints. And um, we um, so uh, and we uh, formulate the Lagrangian function. Then um, we can formulate what is known as the dual objective function or dual Lagrangian function, which uh, plays an important role in support vector machines, um, which is defined as a function of the Lagrange multipliers only. So you see that Q is a function of lambda only. Um, and um, it's defined as um, the function, as the Lagrange function at the location of um, a minimum um, with respect to the, what is called the primal variables or X. Yeah? So um, that is the dual objective function. So the dual objective function is a function only of the Lagrange multipliers, not of the original uh, variables X. And it's uh, defined as the minimum um, with respect to X of the Lagrangian, which then renders this on the right-hand side only a function of lambda. Yeah. The dual problem itself is then defined as maximize this dual objective function subject to the constraint that lambda is equal or larger um, to zero. Yeah? So um, if you have this um, primal problem, um, you can formulate a dual problem by first defining the Lagrangian, finding its minimum with respect to x, and then calling this your dual objective function and then maximizing this subject to the constraint that lambda is larger than zero. And then in principle, a solution of the dual problem is also a solution of the primal problem. However, <laughs> not necessarily. And um, I'm not sure I need to actually go over that in detail um, because we don't really need it for support vector machines in that detail. So. Um, it's not that easy that if you now solve the um, um, dual problem that um, the solution for the Lagrange multiplier that you then have and, and which you can use to evaluate based on the other constraints on the necessary conditions uh, to evaluate also your primal um, uh, variables that this is necessarily also a solution. What is guaranteed, and this is called weak duality, is that um, this uh, um, dual function lower bounds the uh, um, original function um, and under uh, some constraints, um, namely that we are dealing with convex functions, um, so in a simple case, so if we're doing something like quadratic programming, um, then um, one then um, strong duality also holds, um, which implies that a solution of the dual problem is actually a solution or can be used as a solution for the primal uh, problem. Yeah. And um, the strong and weak duality I um, have shown here. So the, what this whole thing was about with this constraint optimization bit that we've done now, and um, I want to also finish now, um, is that first of all, our support vector machine problem is somehow of this form, right? So we've seen we want to uh, minimize this uh, one over the um, um, uh, weight vector, and we have uh, constraints, namely that our yi times uh, this uh, other business is um, larger or equal to zero. And now um, I've told you um, a little bit that this um, this kind of problem is an example for a general problem or for the general problem of constraint optimization. That if you want to solve constraint optimization problems, you uh, need essentially to write down the Lagrangian function and compute its derivative set to zero with a little bit more, which is given in the Kausch-Kuhn-Tucker uh, solutions, and then solve all of this for the optimum. 
if this is difficult, you can, maybe that's easier, um, reformulate the problem as a dual problem um, by defining the uh, dual objective function and maximizing this with respect to the um, Lagrange multiplier and then use the, this solution and the constraints to evaluate the primal things. And these you can have a look at and also read uh, the notes that are, it's very interesting. Um, questions about this because now um, we are basically at a, in a position where we can now reformulate our um, support vector machine training problem as a quadratic program because you now know what a quadratic program is um, and um, then we can actually train our support vector machine using just convex optimization and no support vector machine toolbox which of course you don't care about but I care about questions right now not uh, let's have a break um, and start again like in 10 to 15 minutes depending on your faces look in 10 minutes okay um, now let's do maybe not that long like Hello, 20 or 30 minutes um, for the remaining time that I speak, but with the focus on what you are then supposed to do. So um, the programming exercise uh, that comes with this uh, session is uh, this. So you are asked to create a training set by sampling from two Gaussian distributions. I assume that you can do that because you've done a lot of statistics programming exercises by now. Um, then to use this training set that you generated um, to train a maximum margin SVM. So you should in some way monitor your training data set that is actually linearly separable. And you should train the SVM using um, this quadratic programming solver uh, CVX opt uh, QP. And then once you have trained it, you can of course, um, based on the weights and bias parameter that you have, you can of course test the generalization performance for new uh, training um, points. Um, the CVXOPT, so that you just know what I'm talking about, that's um, a Python-based uh, um, 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 package um, for convex optimization, um, which is developed, uh, among others, by this Vandenberg guy who was at this machine learning, learning summer school years ago. Um, and here is the book. Um, and this is a general uh, convex optimization um, um, yeah, package that implements uh, different ways to um, actually find minima. It also um, includes um, things or addressing problems such as, um, oops, here's the user guide, I think I have it there. Um, such as uh, quadratic programming. Yeah? So there is this CVX OPT solvers QP, which solves a pair of primal and dual convex quadratic programming, uh, quadratic programs. So it's good that you know what primal and dual programs are. We only deal with the primal problem. And this is uh, this uh, dual, uh, quadratic programming problem, sorry, this quadratic programming problem, problem that I already introduced. So that's essentially the um, um, exercise. But I appreciate that at this point it's not quite clear how, a, how our support vector machine training now uh, uh, can be written in the form of um, um, such a, um, a primal quadratic programming problem. And this is what I um, now want to um, show you. But I think actually um, depending on your preference I show you the result and show you that there is a proof, but I'm not necessarily work over the proof if you don't want me to. Um, so we now want to, we now go back to uh, support vector machine training. We go first to maximum margin classification and we want to now translate this into a quadratic programming problem by using actually the dual problem uh, formulation um, to first of all be able to express support vector machine training the way that CVX opt wants us to or quadratic programming uh, um, programs want, want us to 
and to also um, lift a little bit the myth or the, the mystics around kernel functions. And the way I did that here is um, in the form of a theorem um, for which then a relatively long proof uh, follows. It's actually not a real proof, it's just, uh, yeah, it's a proof, like my proofs always are, they are just uh, calculating things and then um, it's shown. Um, but we may not go over that in uh, detail, depending on what you want. So we start again with our maximum margin support vector machine training problem that we've seen a couple of uh, hours ago. So we want to minimize uh, the weight uh, vector um, norm with respect to um, W and subject to the constraints that um, we do correct classification. Yeah? So this is again that our yi times our linear affine function uh, is equal or larger to 1, 1 if it's a support vector and larger than 1 if it's um, correct classification. And we assume that this is possible because we assume a linear several training set. Um, now the dual problem for this is given by uh, maximizing this function q, which is given by the sum of uh, Lagrange multipliers lambda i minus one half two sums over all Lagrange multipliers, products of our um, um, targets and uh, the dot product of uh, the dot products of all training feature vectors. Yeah. So um, what is um, important here is that you appreciate that the training data um, of course the training data determines the training set determines what the optimal weights are for maximum large and classification the training data here enters um, the uh, maximization or the, the optimization routine um, here at, as these yi and yj so they um, um, pl all play a role and um, one important thing is that the only way that actually the feature vector enter this problem is by means of all the uh, scalar products um, or all the dot products between uh, all um, feature vectors. Yeah. So um, the feature vectors, and this is actually this is quite crucial for this whole kernel methods business, and also for um, yeah. I don't know for what, but for this kernel method methods is definitely important. Um, the um, feature vectors themselves um, do not enter the optimization, but the dot products. And one thing that is important about this is that, of course, then um, in the functions themselves, if you have these 16-dimensional um, feature vectors, instead of putting in um, 16 times 1,000 numbers, um, you put in 16 uh, times uh, 16 uh, numbers because you only put in um, minus the double ones and um, because you only put in the um, dot products yeah so it's actually quite a um, computational um, and um, um, efficient approach and, and, and um, yeah minimizes the uh, uh, computational load of this a lot um, so this dual problem uh, dual problem um, for this primal problem is of this form um, if you, um, if, of course, if you solve the dual problem, you only get the Lagrange, the optimal Lagrange multiplier, which maximizes this dual uh, function. And um, if you then want to uh, now actually plot your optimal hyperplane or, or use it, you of course need to um, evaluate the weights again and also the bias parameter. And um, you get the weights by putting uh, in your optimal Lagrange multiplier and um, uh, summing them over this. So you somehow have this, um, this is what they in support vector machines always call an expansion of the weight parameter in terms of the training data. So think that here, of course, the feature vectors, they um, have m dimensions like your weights. So, and these are scalars. So you have the sum of all the training feature vectors times the optimal Lagrange multiplier times the target variables. You sum them together, you get your optimal weights. Um, to get um, the optimal bias parameter, um, you actually um, um, do this. <laughs> so you compute an average, essentially. The question is, of course, why? And uh, what I'm, uh, um, what I essentially um, telling you here is what you also find then in the books or the Bowser uh, paper 
where they say, okay, we have this problem, we have motivated this from geometric uh, uh, things. Uh, and of course, the dual problem looks like this. Uh, for me, it was not really clear why the dual problem looks like this. So um, I actually uh, wrote down all the things that you need to do on the next couple of slides, which um, you will see. Before we get to that, if um, you have this dual problem, um, it's actually fairly straightforward to rewrite, uh, rewrite this as a quadratic programming uh, problem because what you see here, for example, is that you uh, multiply all uh, possibilities of lambda i and lambda j and then you sum uh, over all of them and of course that's the same as taking the dot product of um, the lambda vector um, and uh, with itself so lambda t times lambda um, so translating this dual problem into the quadratic programming uh, um, problem is fairly straightforward which essentially just follows with um, the definition of matrix multiplication. So what you have to do to do that essentially is to concatenate all your um, target variables um, to define what is called the Gram matrix, which is the matrix of all um, dot products of your training feature vectors. Then define this matrix P of the dual uh, of the uh, quadratic programming uh, um, program as um, the outer product of the target variable vectors with the Gram matrix, and for the remaining things here, um, you basically need to specify either ones or, or um, identity matrices uh, accordingly, so that you uh, respect that this lambda uh, is larger than zero and the sum of the lambda times yi. Um, is um, zero, which of course you get, for example, by um, defining um, uh, yt, uh, define the matrix R in the quadratic programming as yt, uh, and lambda is lambda, uh, and b to be zero, and then you, uh, for example, have uh, specified this. So that's relatively um, straightforward. The harder part is, or at least what I found a little bit harder, uh, is to um, transform this primal problem into the dual problem. Before we discussed this um, and I asked you about this. Um, one can do a very similar thing with respect to the soft margin training. So again, this was uh, motivated by uh, or basically involved these slack variables, which uh, could be um, which one also wants to minimize. Ideally, they are all zero, but uh, one allows for a little bit of slack so they can be between zero and one or for a few of them maybe or even bigger than uh, one. One can transfer this quite uh, readily also into this dual problem. And then the dual problem actually looks very similar to the dual problem of the maximum margin classification with the only difference that um, the lambda i, so the Lagrange multipliers, are now constrained uh, to not only be larger than zero, but also smaller equal to uh, c. The conversion to the optimal weights and uh, optimal bias parameter is then the same. So this, I haven't included uh, how to transfer this, um, so how to transfer this problem into this dual problem that is uh, can be done in an analog fashion. So if you want to prepare for the exam, uh, you might want to no, I'm just kidding. If you um, but if you want to really get into support vector machines, uh, first exercise would be to do this transformation, uh, like the maximum margin is done. Um, one thing, one final thing um, I want to point out, um, and this relates to this whole kernel business, because Bernard Schulkopf. Uh, who is, uh, of course, uh, now a very important machine learning person in um, uh, Germany, and who was a student of Wapnik. Uh, he's famous for kernel methods, or at least that's what he did when, when, when from 2000 to 2010. I think he's maybe got, went a little bit into uh, cause and inference by now, but um, kernel methods, that's uh, the big thing that uh, they did. So what is that about? And um, this just maybe basically is a little bit of an outlook um, because um, this relates to exactly this dual problem formulation where you have um, these dot products of the training feature vectors. So um, somehow they realized when they reformulated the primal uh, problem of support vector machine training that the important thing uh, uh, for, for the optimization uh, are these measures of uh, similarity, of course, then in relation um, to um, the target variables. Yeah? So if they are, um, if um, x i and x j are in the same class, then of course y i 
times yj is always positive. If uh, they are in a different class, uh, yi times yj is always negative. Um, and um, of course, you know that scalar products are a measure of similarity. So you have this uh, kind of this uh, distance encoding information of the training set. You have that in these scalar products. And um, together with the um, labels, this enters the optimization in a way that the optimization can then basically realize that if the scalar product is um, large, then they are similar. And this is always goes together with positive uh, um, yi times yj. And if they uh, um, are very dissimilar, so almost uh, if the scalar product is zero, then this goes with a negative yi yj. Now this motivated, uh, this is also what's shown here, um, this motivated to um, think in the following way. If um, we have um, a training data set, which in our um, space is not linearly separable, maybe we can project the feature vectors into some other high dimensional space where the data are uh, linearly separable. Um, and hope, yeah, uh, hope for this linear separability, um, the, um, which um, is, for example, shown here. So here you have um, um, in, uh, feature uh, input data, which is clearly not linearly separable because you cannot put a line through it. Um, then because of the formula how a ellipse works, you can transform uh, form this, uh, these feature vectors using a function phi. Um, into a higher dimensional space where you can do linear separation. And now the important thing about this whole kernel business is you don't need to actually carry out this transformation into this high dimensional space. And you don't actually need to figure out what kind of transformation this is. The only thing that you need is uh, the dot product in this high dimensional space because you uh, this uh, um, transform feature space because in the end only the dot product um, or the kernel um, um, enters the training problem um, or the, the training program anyway. So this then motivated to um, look uh, for kernel functions that somehow help um, to with um, um, non-linearly separable training data. And this basically this was kind of the, the this is the motivation for this kernel uh, business. So. On the one hand, we are, on the one hand, the hope that if you do something to the training data, that you find linear separability in some other space, and on the other hand, the insight that you don't actually need to do and find this mapping, you only need uh, the dot product because that's how the optimization works. So this is then, and this is actually where I don't know any more anything else about uh, kernel uh, methods. Is um, this is there then where uh, kernel um, methods start from? Um, and I also actually don't know how, um, what's the state of kernel methods these days, whether people uh, uh, still think it's a very cool thing or they think it's outdated or whatever. At least in the 2000s, when I was in tubing, it was all about this book, Learning with Kernels. And if you try to read it, you, it's really hard to read. <laughs> anyway, I, had, I didn't understand a word when I was reading this. Um, in 2005. Now reading it, I see why it's like like Carl Christen papers. Now when I reread these things that I didn't understand at one point, um, at least I understand why I didn't understand them in the old days and still find them hard to understand. But I know that it's because, for example, they are not explaining this, 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 and this and that. So that was kernel stuff uh, I, and uh, this thing with the square, uh, with the dot product. Now, um, my question to you is essentially, so we can do two things. Um, you can either now start working on the uh, programming exercise. For the programming exercise, you only need this uh, slide and this slide to translate once you obtain some um, training data. So you should create training data. Um, um, so basically sample uh, two-dimensional Gaussian to uh, classes. Um, then have training data and then use the training data in this formulation um, into CVOx uh, solvers QP to get the optimal rates. So, you know, actually for, for the exercise, you only need these two slides and understand what's uh, on them. Um, and you also have my uh, code that is in the um, thing, uh, in, in the um, Google Drive folder. Um, 
that's one option. So you start working on this now so that you are actively engaged and it's not just me telling you things and it's hard to follow and one has to do something like yourself. Um, the other option is, and I think actually that's a good idea, the other option is that um, I tell you how this transformation works, how you go from the this primal problem to the dual problem. So from now I'm just telling you that is the solution, which you can also look up in the Bose book, uh, in the Bose paper, on the, on the, in the Schulkopf and Smaller book, um, but you don't know really why. So who wants to now go to work and uh, implement this? And who wants me to explain more? Definitely nobody wants to do that. Um, and the rest, they want to go home or what? What's this? Machine learning. It's much more, it's, 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 it's so simple compared to statistics. Um, yeah. Um, so, so do you think, um, well, let's just try it. So I think um, the, um, we should at least try it. Um, so let's give, uh, so nobody wants me to explain this. Um, which is fair enough. It's all written down there. Um, it uh, basically involves uh, writing down the Lagrangian, writing down the dual objective function, minimizing it, um, rewriting things, um, and then having it. And um, these formulas, well, one has to figure out based on the constraints. And then you get into the standard quadratic programming form, and then you have a uh, get the um, uh, mysticism out of um, support vector machines. So then I would suggest um, we uh, stop the lecture here. Uh, before, before I do that, I show you what I mean in terms of that you have um, code. And then we take at least one hour and I want to see whether within, you can solve this within one hour. Do you usually go home by two? <laughs> <laughs> some people say yes, some people say no. I see. Um, I see. Um, so let me just before we stop, let me just show you that you have the solution. And that I am also able to program in Python. I have to prove that to myself. So I'm using Spider a lot. Is anyone else using Spider? Uh, Spider is like MATLAB. Um, that's why I'm using it um, because it has the same interface as uh, MATLAB. Um, it's definitely so. I don't like Jupyter notebooks that much. Um, I find them a little bit annoying because I'm also don't like this cell-based programming where you always have to do this and then this and then this. And so I like to write scripts as a whole. And I just want to um, show you that there is the script in this folder that is called code. Yeah. So there is Bayesian filtering now from um, statistics and support vector machines from uh, this. Um, so there is a lot of code that does this. What it doesn't do is to test uh, the um, performance. So um, yeah, if you need a starting point for coding this up, this would be a starting point. Um, Good. Just wanted to show it and have it on tape that I have done something. Good. Then I stop this here.